with two shallow footsteps, you hear crunching beneath your boots, a sound that contrasts the hollow gusts of wind. The air is heavy, thick in your lungs, and carries with it a sharp, acrid tang, the unmistakable burn of salt. You lick your dry lips. The taste is putrid, both salted and spoiled. The few puddles you stumble upon are viscous, a syrupy consistency that clings to any object it touches. As you look into the murky reflection in the puddle, where your once smooth skin adorned your face, a grotesque scar now sprawls from your temple to your chin. It's not just a simple line or a healed wound. It's a labyrinth horror. The skin twisted, puckered, gnarled like melted wax. Esperanza, Boira, please describe your character with the understanding of what you're looking and what's reflecting back at you. Esperanza is... Um, very hunched over, sort of seeming to be tipping towards this puddle with their whole body. It's shaggy, curled, and seemingly chopped up a bob of curly hair moving around her face as these blue eyes seem to almost be outliers in the scenery. It doesn't seem necessarily to affect them as much as it maybe should. They almost seem like they're staring at a stranger, even though it's very clear that this this short three foot nine humanoid is looking at what should by all means be a reflection of themselves. Uh, dressed a little androgynously, button-up slacks, boots tucked in, definitely not making the appearance of a lady, even though it is quite clear that from a purely physical perspective, this was uh, somebody who was born female. But it's almost like they're in a daze. You're standing in a city, the wind picking up around you. By your side, a massive wall looms over your head. You stand surrounded by buildings that are encrusted, their facades sparkling in the eerily dim light, the salt encrusting them. The trees, or what skeletal remains, are left, are thickly coated also in this gleaming salt crystal. They clink like chandeliers in the wind. The ground is littered with remnants of life that once thrived here. Discarded toys, rusted bicycles, and even the stray remains of pets forever frozen in their last moments. Their forms, though distorted, tell a tale of a rapid end, caught completely unaware. The only light that illuminates is a harsh beam that crosses an alleyway ahead of you. What would you like to do? Their eyes scan around at all of this kind of scenery. A quick glance here, there, and then towards the light. It seems that she's made up her mind that it is the only direction to really go in. And she will approach that direction. You head down the glistening cobblestones and you get to the corner of the alleyway. You look at the storefronts that litter each side, destroyed damaged and covered. And down the hall, you see 
At first glance, the light cast is blinding. It's nearly impossible to discern shape, except it oscillates, defying all natural laws of, laws of form between haunting shadow and radiant brilliance. There you see a spire that claws from the earth, silhouetted by the light behind it. The cold stone beneath your feet pulses softly, rhythmic yet inconsistent, as if the earth's heart itself is beating. You know this place, or at least you've heard of it. This is Crow Perch, the citadel, the mysterious city, a city whose walls have long been closed to the public. What would you like to do? My reason for being here is, is very clear. And it is, it is the only direction that I have. I have a name. And I think I remember the address correctly. I have to get there. I have to find this person. So it is time to start looking. You continue down the path, the salty crust beneath your feet crunching inconsistently. But then suddenly a different sensation, a soft give to a footstep, followed by an unsettling crack. Your heart skips a beat as you instinctively look down. Beneath your boot, a partially obscured layer of salt and dust lies a form all too familiar, unmistakable even. A human, a hollowed out silhouette formed entirely of salt, its arms lay by its side, its face turned upwards. But where the chest would have been solid and raised, now there's a cavernous indentation, your foot unwittingly crushing it, causing the insult encasement to crumble, revealing a cavernous void. There's a, a sidestep around this this body, kind of doing the uh, the speedy walk to get away from it. You get to the building and you see that the windows are fogged. It's just reflecting your face. You could lean in to see more inside if you like, or you can do something else. What would you like to do? Check the side, look at the door, around. Bam, 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 knocking right on the door. Doctor? Your knocks echo from inside. Building feels hollow and cavernous. You hear the knocks come back at you with a reverberation. It's dead silent. All you hear is the echoes of wind that caverns through the city. She'll move with that same expedited walk to see if there's a way around the building into an alley, see if there's maybe a door at the back that she could try. You get to the back and you do see a door. I, though, it's very dark. There's a moment of warily seeming as if she's deciding to knock, but then she pauses, opens the palm and pushes on the door peering inside. Doctor, are you... Are you at home? As you lean into the doorway to peer inside, there inside, you see a figure silhouetted, seems to be completely motionless. The glasses you're wearing, the Nova's, they don't seem to illuminate detail. Doc doctor? Is that... And as she's saying this, she's stepping slowly into the room to try and make out the figure just a little better. I, s I saw your, your clipping in the... 
and the sign. You... You're taking patience? You see, as you approach ever so slightly, pale flesh, eyes wide open, and a silent scream stretching its features as if frozen in time. As though it had been there, watching and waiting for this very moment to reveal itself. The chill of this unexpected visage sends a jolt down your spine, causing every hair on your neck to stand, and as you recoil just a little bit, you slip and fall onto the ground backward, hitting your head on the pavement. And with that, you're jolted awake as your head slips off of your hand that's been propping it up on the windowsill. You don't remember going to sleep. Sleep, after all, is a concept that has always been fleeting to you anyway. Yet, you can almost still feel that acrid taste of salt on your lips, a piercing migraine at your scalp, the gentle rocking of the old vessel, her royal rose, beckoning you back to the world of the living. Reach down to where they thought they left their Novas before they had fallen asleep. At first, initially checking right immediately to their side where they would normally keep them, but then having to pause and go, wait. The man sitting next to you picks up the Novas from the ground. He reached for them and then dropped them. Here you go. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You recognize this man. His name is Mr. Augie. He's been escorting you all of this time. And with that, he puts his hand around your arm, speaking up. You all right? He's squeezing a bit harder than normal. You sure that was your first dose for the day? It was my first dose for the day. Look, here. I'm just gonna move to a pack and pull out this little case of vials. And it's clear in there that four of those vials out of ten are empty. And that there's six that are still full. It was my first today. I'm just getting back into it. It, it takes a bit. All right. I'm gonna go get a coffee. You want one? Yes. Please. He stands up, leaving you alone in your seat, and walks down the alleyway towards the galley where some food and drink is available. You're left alone there, and as you look around, you see a number of people sitting silently. This is the common space after all, a small table in front of you. You do have a room. It sleeps only two, and that's where you would be staying with Mr. Augie. Um, what does it look like outside? There's a gentle patter of rain just outside the window. You see the drops sliding down the glass. And there's slow drones of metal and timber as the ship sways in the sea. Better than it was five minutes ago. I'll take it. Here you go. He sits back down next to you, putting the cup down. It doesn't look like good coffee, if anything is cheap. And he, you see his cup is actually looks a lot better. It's nicely decorated ceramic instead of paper. He mixes it with a small silver spoon and adds milk to his. Like a moment of recognition for Esper. He takes the cup, eyes on him, and just downs it immediately. You know, you could try to enjoy it. I could, but... When I don't get any cream or sugar, what's to enjoy? 
Fair enough. By the way, um, I know uh, we said you'd be heading straight to Dr. Neville, but um, there's uh, another doctor on the island you need to see first to be put on his case. A formality. I'm sure you don't mind. Well, I do mind. But like I talked with the doctor back on shore, if I have to do it, I have to do it. If it's possible, could we just try to make sure that we're in and we're back out as soon as we can be? I... It's up to the doctor, of course. He has to okay your visit to Dr. Neville. Just a formality, um... Dr. Uh, Faust. Yeah. All right. We'll do these fucking formalities. As this is going on, we go somewhere else. There's a haze of cigarette smoke that perpetually clouds these hallways. The lighting is ornate. It illuminates everything. It has an incandescent hum. There's a busy chatter amongst the crew and its passengers. The assistant who's been escorting you all of this time looks overwhelmed. You pass by rows of doors in first-class cabins, paintings on the wall. All of it looks expensive, ornate rugs as well. A stark contrast to the common quarters you had to walk through to get here. You see that things don't seem to be going all too well on the ship, but it had a rough start to begin with, with more crew and more passengers than were expected. The door's just up ahead, ma'am. Apologies for the chaos, doctor. When we set sail, the tides of task rise high. It's not always this frenzied, I promise. Your quarters are just up ahead. I, I hope you find them to your liking, despite the rush. And you hear the footsteps of your bodyguard just a few steps behind you. The powerful steps echo through the halls, if not just with a slight arrhythmia. As you move through the halls, weaving through the frantic crew dotting to and fro, you take out a pocket mirror and give yourself a look over. Dr. Isadora Glass, would you please describe your character? Dr. Isadora Glass is uh, a woman in what we might politely call late middle age. Her once dark curls are streaked steely gray. And though she's not particularly wrinkled or hunched, she does walk with the support of a lovely cane with a, a seemingly antique silver handle. She has a very upright posture and that sort of bird-like build. She looks like someone who was made to practice piano for hours as a child and probably believes more children should have to do that now. At first, she is no doubt a bit forbidding in appearance. But as she looks up at the person who enters the room, they can see into her eyes, green, gray pools you either want to fall into or don't want to look into at all. And it's clear why the doctor is such a celebrated alienist. People want to talk to her. She looks at her pocket watch and she looks up those eyes seeming to take in everything, though her body is very still. Uh, right this way. And gets to a door. The assistant opens it, expectingly, to walk in with Dr. Glass, and says, Oh, uh, sorry, and closes the door right away. We'll go somewhere else. You carefully scan text. Mundane work for most, but not for you. You study the same book a hundred times over. You've held it so many times you could recognize every single fold in the pages and emboss of gold in the cover. Its pages have been written over thoroughly through years of study. It's hard to tell where the notes end and where the text begins. Just to the right of you, it's a suitably comfortable bed. Your writing desk displays a sprawling of belongings that you've unpacked for the trip to Port Hillcrest. A trip much shorter than the months you've spent at sea already traveling to make it this far. 
on your bed, a breastplate laid out, heavily worn from travel, a healer's kit. On your desk, an ink and an inkwell for your studies. And also on your bed, a small paper package, still unopened, recently offered by a messenger upon boarding her royal rose. The small double room you find yourself in isn't the private quarters you were promised for this trip, but for a humble man of God such as yourself, a man of the cloth, it's easy to overlook. As your eyes focus from lines of code on the sacred testimonium veritas, you see your reflection in the magnifying glass that you're holding. Nihilus von Stonen, please describe your character. The name is indeed Nihilus von Stonen. I'm a human of average height, a clerical wizard with the red brins charming like hair and stout petite like vigor. A sharp face with a black curly sweet mustache. When one would look at Nihilus, you would clearly see that his attire speaks volumes. A long overhanging black coat, classy, with a clerical white collar, symbolizing a religion definitely of devotion. Underneath he wears a colorful yet expensive three-piece suit, and balancing in between those is a closed vest, like a cherry on top finishing this expensive professional suit he wears, to a book connected to a chain on the hip of his belt pockets. And opposite side of this hip is a chained metal device, round in shape, a single, a simple pocket watch, but why would he need haste, one might wonder. And lastly, your eye is pulled like a burning sun on a high noon, impossible to ignore. There, towards the center of his chest, hangs a golden chained forest green holy cross. Nihilus clutched the holy cross strongly with both of his hands, as in silence prayer. You finish the last line of your studies for the day. Lux veritas nos semper ducat. May the light of truth always guide us. Carefully you place the felt page marker between the pages and close the book. Now for that package. Hmm. It's about time I should open this. Hmm. I've had it for a couple of days now, yet... And slowly he does, and wrap it carefully, structurally, curiously. Its contents are incredibly neatly packaged. The paper is folded with such careful intention, not a wrinkle on it. Even though it's been held by presumably many to get it to you. Inside, there's a very bizarre little piece of technology. It's a handheld device, but it has a sling over the side, presumably to hold it over your shoulder. It's crude, hand-machined parts. A round speaker protrudes from a metal grill, and another cloth-wrapped cable has a funnel-shaped mouthpiece at the end. While you're not unfamiliar with communications devices in general, a relatively modern technology, this one looks artisanally made, custom made even. There's no note to be found. By the preach of truth, this must be a sign at least. Uh, a device like such, for me? Hmm. It's clearly powered by the sun and I should keep it on me, although I'm so far away by home. I'm all alone. I've done this before. Whew. He takes a deep breath and he clips it to the belt. Although there is a lingering moment to his thoughts, he doesn't want to stand out even more than he already does. Yet, he feels like this is something important. After all, it's given to him. For a moment, your door bursts open and you see one of the ship's crew look at you in the eyes and then briskly close the door. On the outside, Dr. Glass, he turns to you. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Glass. I realize you paid top dollar for a private room uh, for yourself and Mr. Trevor, but there seems to be a mix-up of some kind and this 
bed, one of them is already taken. I could look into it, but right now things are a bit hectic and I might just have to downgrade one of you to common lodging just for now until we get this sorted out. A bit hectic to tell me who I'm sharing a bed with tonight? Uh, yes, I do know many of the, the members who are aboard this vessel. One moment. He opens the door again. Uh, sir, could you please tell me your name? Um, Anilus Nihilus von Stonen. Although, is there some kind of trouble? Can I assist? No, no trouble at all. Uh, thank you, Anilus. You're just fine. You'll be staying in this room. Uh, we don't. Let me or, let me figure this one out. If, the, if there are any issues, I'm, I'm happy to be of service. As you're saying that, he closes the door again. A bit rudely, but you can tell his hectic nature is kind of shared with many on the crew right now. Um, Mr. Von Stonen is a man of the cloth, a perfectly good uh, roommate to share your accommodations with for the trip. Uh, that is, either one of you, I, I don't want to presume on who would be staying with him. You don't want to presume, I, I believe it's a little late for that, but what is happening here? Uh, well... No, we need so few things, but... Yes, uh, so... Uh, privacy is one of them. I'll explain. Uh, there were more um, travelers on this ship than we expected. Uh, we had to take them on. It was just a requirement from the island itself. Um, and one of them took on a, a suite, one of the most expensive rooms, and it seems to have shuffled around a few of the travelers. Uh, so... With that, you have a roommate, and unfortunately, one of you will have to be downgraded. Yes, young man, I assumed you would say the problem was that you'd taken on more people than you had rooms. The question is, why is it now my problem? Are you referring to the suite that we paid for? Do you expect me to share a bedroom with my bodyguard? I think that's hardly appropriate. Um. Or with this... A strange young man with, of some sort of cloth? Yes, I suppose now is also a bad time to inform you, but um, it seems that your luggage has been misplaced as well. Um, what? We, we believe that it's all in the cargo hold, but the ticket number and location just don't match our records. I've been notified and they're already looking into it. However, we'll be comping your lodging on the island until it's resolved. And she looks and doesn't speak. She gives him a look and there's a silence between them for a moment. You see extreme discomfort on his eyes. And after a moment, she breaks his gaze and says, oh, there's nothing to be done. There's nothing to be done. So Nihilus opens the door um, and you can see him stand there. He, he closes the, the book as well. He was holding. Um, I, the, the, the door is not that thick. Uh, surely uh, there's, there's enough room. Uh, we can figure something out. I'm happy to be of service. Uh, whoever I would share with, I'm not much of a trouble. Well, I'm glad something on this ship isn't that thick. Uh, look, uh, it is our policy that every passenger has a bed, and we unfortunately can't allow anybody to stay in, in this section of the ship unless there is a bed assigned to them. I would have to insist that somebody get downgraded. I don't particularly care who. Obviously, I care, but there's not much that can be done at this point anyway. What kind of downgrade? You can see I'm not the best with stairs, so if it's below decks too far, that shan't do for me, I'm afraid. Perhaps your bodyguard, and he points over towards Trevor. Would you mind heading down uh, to the common areas for now? Uh, we can always try to resolve this later during the course of the travel. <sighs> and she looks at Trevor, not really wanting to be separated from him, but she wants to see what he thinks. Doctor, if I can speak, do you really trust the people that work in this ship to handle your luggage? Do you really trust them to um, handle it with the care that it needs? Listen, I can, I can head down into the common area. I'm no stranger to that. But, uh, you know, maybe I can do a little bit of legwork before I bed down for the night. I'm sure that this uh, gentle man of God uh, 
doesn't pose much of a threat, albeit maybe for uh, conversational purposes. I'm I can terribly sorry f- for giving any issues at all. If if I didn't need the, the room for space uh, for my studies, I'd be happy to share between you and me, dear sir. Um, <laughs> that I don't think is going to be in the cards for either one of us. I take up a bit of space. What was that? I, I'm sorry, the, the tussling of the ship and the, the chaotic. I didn't quite get that. I'm saying that if we were to bed down together, there would be an imbalance in comfort, I would think. As much as um, Dr. Glass's needs are fairly well stated by her, I would think. So Nihilus's things are out, correct? Completely unpacked. The bed is sprawled over the writing desk. The one that's in the room has a book on it and also has a number of items there as well. He's sprawled. Uh, do you think she clocks the book? Oh, certainly. It definitely looks like a, um, you know, a religious text. That's clear. She eyes the young man, sort of trying to get his measure. She wonders briefly if he's an instigator in this situation, as she wonders of most people. What did you say your name was, young man? Von Stonen? Uh, mine? Ah, yes. Uh, Nihilus. <coughs> Nihilus von Stonen. Uh. I hope that incident with the waiter wasn't providential and we're not headed for a lot of broken glass. But I seem to be your strange bedfellow, Mr. Von Stonen. It would appear so. I'm sure we can come to some sort of fair arrangement so we can enjoy this lovely trip together. Um, apologies for <laughs> the mess I've made already. I wasn't expecting company, but I shall make due adjustments. And she strides in and says, Yes, I think you can put uh, all of your things in that corner, and when uh, Trevor recovers mine, we'll find spot for them. I do have professional needs as well. I will be uh, working on my book for most of the journey. Uh, well, you and me seem to be sharing a common passion in that case. I also seem to be working on my book, although for me it is rewriting so many times. So are you a writer? Uh, yes. Uh, some people have even heard of my most recent book. Uh, I write on the psychology of humans and particularly in the aspects of our minds, our souls that are silenced, unvoiced. Uh, My latest book made a bit of a stir, I think. Uh, Not that most people have read it or understood it, but everyone knows there are some saucy bits in there, so I'm popular these days. By devotion's true, that seems quite intimate then. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the work, as I'm not familiar with these lands themselves. Intimacy unvoiced, the dual self's role in primal relations. You've never heard of that? Uh, uh, where are you, where do you hail from, Mr. Von Stonen? Uh, from the, the lands of Keyenstone. Uh, up to the west, where well, southwest, to be more exact, of Sablemere. Uh, well... I thought it had been published there, but perhaps it's... It's fusingly possible. Uh, it could be that I seem to have not been caught up. I've, it's been a long road for me. Um, uh, sir, and he points towards the servant of the ship. Yes, I, uh, again, I I would leave you to your, your rooms. Uh, I do have to, unfortunately, attend to another matter regarding the captain of House Meridial. Um, I hope everything is okay between all of you now, and... Mr. Trevor, if you could uh, head down to the common quarters, there's no assigned spaces. You just grab a bunk that's available. Mm. <sighs> sure. Um, Miss Dr. Glass's belongings, you say that uh, they're down in the storage? Yes, indeed. And it is accessible if you'd like to go search for yourself. Well... <sighs> I travel pretty light. I can, um, I'll stop by the common area, drop my stuff off, and I'll see about your stuff, Doctor. 
that actually sounds like uh, a perfect idea. Do do poke around the storage, uh, looking for our things, and we'll discuss when you return. <laughs> right. I hate sailing. Oh, he's gonna kind of give a little, <clears throat> Mister uh, Von Stone and Doctor. He's just gonna kind of shuffle up the coat that he's wearing, grab his meager belongings, and head out. Uh, let me join you out of this uh, hallway. Uh, I'll give you, Sir Doctor, Miss Doctor, um, some time to uh, unpack and get at ease. Please take a seat. I'm going to grab some fresh air. Of course. Make yourselves comfortable. I'll be on my way. Thank you very much for understanding, given the circumstances. And he turns and rushes down the other direction in the hall. It's funny how people thank you for understanding when you simply have no choice. Yeah, just what I was thinking. But whatever. I'm used to sleeping in the dirt. I'm sure that uh, ain't much dirt to be found here. Whatever. One might be challenged in all kinds of ways and when it comes to life. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be benefited on a later time by something else that happens. Uh, karma, so to speak. Let's just try to keep an open mind and try to make the best of our situation, shall we? Um, what was your name again, sir? I didn't quite catch it. Uh, you can just call me Trevor. That's what she called me. That's what you'll call me, too. Trevor. Splendid. Pleasure to meet you too, Splendid. I promise I'll not lay a finger on the doctor and be on my good behavior. Ha! Ah. Dr. Glass laughs at the idea. <laughs> she says, go along, Trevor, and just as the holy man says, let us both pray that someday you and I face a challenge. <laughs> Wouldn't that be novel? Yes. Well, uh, you know... Karma is as it is, but uh, money talks louder than karma, I think. So I think I can deal with some uh, less than extravagant quarters, so long as I'm still getting paid for this. <laughs> in fact, take this in case anyone gives you trouble down, down below. And she gives him a little bit of money. Mighty kind. I... I don't think that uh, any of them down there is going to give me much trouble at all. And if they do, you know, I'll make sure that they realize just how uh, how much you value your belongings. Thank you as ever, Trevor. In the meantime, we'll head back to Esper, who sits kind of stuck in this corner chair, barricaded, uh, most likely intentionally, by her handler and uh, he looks back over you fair and okay Esper's got their head kind of tipped back against the wall and eyes closed they seem as if they could be asleep again but then all the same their mouth opens okay as I will ever be I was uh, reading through your past your file here, just the details they give me for the trip, and uh, I see you've uh, you've actually seen this doctor before, haven't you? Yes. Yes, I've seen him before. What a coincidence. Small world. Uh, I have a profile here. Dr. Horatio Reginald Faust. Um, expertise in potions and treatments that involve supplements and chemicals. The more he's talking about it, behind him, there are an increasing amount of subtle shifts and fidgets coming from Esper. And eventually she takes in a big breath. You could say I'm on the familiar side with some of those, those things. Uh, just so you know what to expect, the doctor is going to refer you to, um, well, your final destination. Uh, though, if he deems that he can treat you suitably, 
he is able to withhold your tra- transfer. You're aware of that, right? <laughs> Listen, um, I don't really know what that file says right now. And I know you probably don't have any power over the situation. So just between you and me, if Dr. Faust couldn't do anything good for me in 11 years under his care, I don't think any attempts he might make to keep me are going to be in very good faith. Well, it's not up to me. Uh, you're, you're in the system again, so it's really up to him how he wants to proceed. I, realistically, I don't even think you have much autonomy here. You just live to make my life so much better, don't you? Well, well, it's not my decision anyway. Uh, I'm just here to get you there, and then uh, once you're in their custody, you're going to be managed by their nurses. I think you even live on site at that point. Um, and it's really up to Mr. Faust whether you even move on from his facility, let alone seek treatment elsewhere. Y- you know, it, it does make me wonder just a little bit. Why wasn't I told earlier that I'd be checking in with Dr. Faust? Uh, let me see the notes here. Uh, let's see. Okay, I see the doctor you consulted with. Uh, he put a script for you to meet Dr. Neville Pettifogger. Um, oh, I see here. Dr. Faust is your uh, head physician, regardless of whether you stopped seeing him. So it looks like once you uh, made arrangements, uh, he was notified and said that you should go see him first. So it looks like uh, the doctor you saw has been overruled. Could you give me just five minutes to be away from you? I'm actually supposed to be keeping an eye on you, but if you promise not to run off anywhere, I can go get another cup of coffee for myself. I... Be 30 feet away from me for all I care. I just... Give me a minute. Sure. Just try not to disturb the other passengers. We don't want to make a scene, uh, Esper. And he stands up and... He walks away, actually, to the mess hall, closing the door behind him. Asper will begin to feverishly pace her little enclosure. We'll head back to Trevor. You make your way down to the common quarters, and it is as loud, boisterous, and frankly uncomfortable as you might expect it to be. You get down the hall into the common quarters, and there it looks like it wasn't meant for luxury or comfort. It's a testament to efficiency, to you know squeezing the most out of every inch of available space. This area of the vessel, kind of hidden away below the more spacious accommodation, is a rabbit warren of narrow corridors, compact rooms, and beds. Each room has bunk beds stacked three high, with barely enough room for a grown man to stand. You squeeze your way through the narrow corridors past people brushing up against them. The mattresses, you can tell, are thin and worn, covered in rough, scratchy fabric that's probably seen better days. The frames creak and groan with every shift of weight of the ship, echoing the same complaints as the timber itself. Trevor, as you walk into this cramped space, there's... every bed looks like it's taken. You go through one at a time, scanning three by three by three. It's clearly first come, first serve, and you pass by several bunk beds that have belongings in them, until finally finding one in the corner at the lowest level of the bunks that's available. And go figure, it's one with a porthole, one of the few that are in this area. There's already somebody laying on the bunk above, stretching their cot down and making the space even more narrow and small to lay in. As you look down, you can see the sea is rough today, its waves churning like blades from the ocean, and you see your reflection in the glass of the window. Trevor, would you please describe your character? Looking back at him is this very large burly, thick, 
half-orc, in sharp contrast to the good doctor. This big hunk of meat stands probably about six and a half feet tall, just shy of 300 pounds. He is tall and wide. He has quite a bit of muscle on him, but he doesn't look like um, a bodybuilder by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you can see there there's quite a bit of chunkiness to him. He has a bit of a gut. Uh, he's more of the farm strong, full day of work of manual labor than going back for a beer with the boys kind of strong. Currently, his face is young, probably placing him from mid to late 20s. The look on his face is one of experience. Uh, not experience that has been given to him all his life. It's one that has kind of been bestowed on him in recent years. He has scars kind of dotting his face from various encounters. Uh, you can see even when he's wearing his long sleeve kind of dark tan chore coat, he's got his fists wrapped up with bandage. You can see the lime green skin on him is sort of blotched with bits of gray. Uh, his face, the signature tusks of a half-orc, however, you can only see one of them kind of poking out one side of his mouth. Uh, the other seemingly has been knocked out in perhaps some encounter, uh, giving him a slight underbite. His eyes are beady and small and can very easily give off a sense of like a persistent scowl. But you can see just the pale blueness betrays a, a freshness of the face. His hair is this long, kind of dark reddish color, combed back, uh, kind of messily into a, a mullet that goes, kind of rests at his shoulders with a bit of scruffiness, uh, kind of framing his jawline. You see he's wearing very simple work trousers uh, and very heavy boots uh, that kind of made it make a clunk as he walks and going through the common area was a hassle. Considering how large he is and how small the area he is in, he kind of, even looking through this porthole at himself, there's the tiredness of his eyes. And even now he stands at kind of a hunch, kind of ducking underneath the bunk above him. Takes a deep breath, and you can see there's kind of a wince of pain as he does so. <sighs> and gives a sigh. <sighs> Lap of luxury, my ass. And he's gonna just collapse into the bunk as it kind of gives a groan of the various joints and bolts kind of like groaning under the pressure as he just tries to relax for just a moment in this place where he is intensely uncomfortable. As you peek at the window, an orcish reflection appears behind yours. Another large figure steps just barely behind you, and you hear, Move it, half-breed. You're in my bed. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm a little new here, but, uh, as far as I can tell, I don't see your name on it. Name doesn't have to be on it. I called dips. Name's Gus, and you're gonna move. I'm sure you tell that to all the little boys and girls who you like to scare in the schoolyard. But, um, Gus... I'm trying to be real nice to y'all. I'm afraid it's first come, first serve. If I wanted a bed, I would have, you know, hucked off any pipsqueak that uh, laid claim to it. I could do that. And, uh, well, <laughs> since you're so familiar with schoolyard vernacular, I'm here first. Therefore, it's mine. Roll either persuasion or intimidation as you prefer. <laughs> oh, first roll. Uh, well, not particularly good either, but we'll find out. Uh, that's a 19. You see, as you're talking, he seems to slouch smaller and smaller. He even leans back into the bunk behind him, starting to look nervous. Oh, well, um, maybe I'll... It might have been the other bunk. It might have been the other bunk. Just, uh... It, Enjoy, enjoy the trip. And he'll been briskly book. turn and start trying to get away, moving in another direction, looking for a place to sleep. <sighs> Man, I hate ships. I hate sailing. I hate the water. I hate this. And he just 
tosses his uh, simple, rustic-looking uh, knapsack at the foot of his bed. <sighs> I'm not staying in here for long, I think. He's just going to gather up all the essentials that he needs, his little pocket watch, and he'll just sort of start. <sighs> Place smells like fucking salt. <sighs> Don't mind me, guys. Just, uh, just leave a man to his business. Outside of the ship, getting some fresh air, we find Nihilus von Stonen, who stepped down the hall and out to the wealthier exterior portion of the ship, one that's sectioned off from the common folk. Only those who paid can access. It's sparsely populated. The air is a bit humid. It doesn't feel the most comfortable outside. You can see a light mist hanging low on the sea around. But there are some, mostly people out here grabbing a smoke. Nihilus, as you step out, you look around and you can see the grandeur of the ship. Wood, metal. It's, it is an ancient yet functional masterpiece that's clearly been upgraded through the ages that it's been in service. You see the captain's deck just above a glass enclosed space that probably has an entrance somewhere from within. And you can see over the railing, the land that the ship set sail from, already growing far in the distance, barely visible. As he makes his slow, dramatic steps, you can see his long, robed uh, coat uh, almost hovering above the floor, which is a couple of inches in between, as he slowly makes his way. You walk around the ship, getting some fresh air, and you notice a few things. First of all, the exterior on the lower level, where all the commoners are allowed to go, is packed. It's almost shoulder to shoulder. It must be very uncomfortable down in the common quarters, leading everybody to take whatever fresh air they can get outside. You definitely feel a separation between yourself and them. The crew and their tension seem to be slowing down ever so slightly. As distance is gained, tasks are completed, and the travel, the long-term travel, starts to set in. There's a small sense of dread that captures over him by his own sense of empathy as he looks down uh, towards the difference between the, the common folk of the ship and between himself. Uh, I shall learn more about this. And he actually takes about a small common uh, notebook that he has in his pocket and makes a couple of notable uh, scribbles and just some helpful reminders to himself. Trevor, you find your way out of the common quarters and out towards the main halls, which lead to stairs, which could lead to the storage rooms. Is that where you're going? Yeah, he wants to uh, get the task done and get back to the doctor as soon as possible. He wants to spend the least amount of time in the common area as possible. So really, without even really asking around, he's just going to start exploring, especially trying to go down into storage. You head down the stairs into the small metal door. This one doesn't look like it's commonly made for passengers. It's heavy to open. And you open in to the lower hull where the storage is located. It's a large room, cavernous even. You could fit a lot down here and it already looks very packed. Many large wooden crates that seem to be nailed shut, at least in this section. Further beyond, you see where a lot of passengers' belongings are. Large rows of shelving and number tags on each row and bags on each segment of each row. As you head down, you walk through the narrow corridors, you hear a rustling behind one of the boxes. Someone hiding there? Uh, hey. You see a, a head peek up, and this doesn't look like one of the crew or even that of a passenger, at least not a passenger they would normally let on the ship. They look messy. Their hair is tangled. There's dirt on their face. Um, keep it between... You, you didn't see me. You, uh, are you going to tell anybody? I don't know. What you doing here? I'm just trying trying to, to get get to um to Port Hillcrest. I can't, can't afford a ticket. You see bags under their eyes. They look incredibly tired, almost sick. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, of course you're going to Port Hill, Chris. That's where we're going. All right. You don't got the money. That's fine. Uh, I don't work for nobody here but Dr. Glass, so... Uh, oh, thank God. Yeah, I, I, I ain't no uh, employee. Uh, so, you know, just a uh, little tip. Someone says who's there, just just shut up. Just don't say nothing. Oh, got it. Got it. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have a couple gold coins, would you? Or maybe a silver to part with? So yeah, he'd, he'd flip one silver coin over in the direction of the uh, of the messy figure. He goes to catch it, and as his hand comes up from behind the box, his body still mostly obscured, he t- tumbles it. It falls to the ground, and he lurches forward to go grab it, and from behind the box, you see a gun fall onto the floor. Not just any. This looks expensive. I mean, any gun in this era would be ornate and handcrafted, but even this one especially. And quickly, looking extremely nervous, pulls the gun back and takes the coin. Uh, thank you so much. Where'd you get that? I found it. Found it on the ground. Found it where? Uh, I found it in one one of the boxes. <sighs> what you planning on doing with it? I was just gonna sell it at Crow per, uh, at Crow Perch t- to be completely honest with you can I how desperate does this person seem and is this desperation stemming from just wanting to get out of this conversation or just not wanting me to you know take it from him roll insight <sighs> an 11. They look agitated. Not at you, but just in general. They look tired and weak. And in terms of desperation, you almost sense a unsettling nature behind their eyes. Not in any supernatural way, but just like that of a not well person. They, with an 11, you notice the dark bags under their eyes. You notice a little staining around their lips as if they take or have taken something. You know that's not a toy, right? You can't just be dropping it like that. That goes off. That's going to make a big bang. And then you got every single worker on this boat coming down here. No, no, I I don't plan on making anything go bang. I'm just going to sell it. I need the money. With an insight of 11, you can tell that that's not entirely true. All right. But something tells me. Listen, man. I don't know where you've been. I don't know your story. But that gun's going to cause you more harm than good. I can tell that much. Word of advice to you. You put it right back where you found it. You betcha, sir. I'm going to do that. You say that. I hear you talking. I want to see you do it. You say you found it in a box. I want to see you do that right now. He steps out from behind the box, holding the gun backwards. He walks down the narrow storage racks and over to one of the crates, 
and tries it, but notices the lid doesn't open on it. It seems to be nailed shut. He goes to the next one and tries it. And this one, however, seems to be accessible. And narrowly opening the lid, he tosses the gun in and closes it. And puts his hands up. There. I put it back. Listen, man. I don't know what you're going through. <sighs> Just keep your head down. You got it, sir. Head down all the way. I'm going to be quiet on the way on the, 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 the trip to, 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 to Port Hill, Hillcrest. Right. And he's going to turn. And trusting this guy, he's going to start to uh, look around and see if there's anybody else in the storage area that he can ask about the doctor's belongings. And if not, he's just going to start rooting through stuff. Yeah, you go down towards where the residential storage is. The racks here have all sorts of luggage. Some of them locked, some of them not. And all the way on the other end, you do see one of the workers putting bags onto a shelf. He turns as you're walking by. Hey, um, uh, it's not for passengers down here. Uh, that's all right. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, just here on an errand. Uh, I suppose, uh, private contractor business. Uh, I'm here on business. Um, listen, uh, someone up top was telling me that someone's luggage got lost. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, luggage belonging to, uh, Dr. Isidore Glass. Um, I could certainly help you with that, uh between you and me just don't tell anybody that I was just tell them I, I sent you out but um glass uh, under G G so um right this way and he'll head over to one of the racks and between the two of you you can start looking through it while that's happening Esper the man is still in the galley he hasn't come back yet what are you doing there's a bit of that fervent pacing and, and a few sideways glances to the door. And slowly, eventually, Esper's lips start to move as if they're talking to themselves. And eventually, it becomes a little bit louder to a full volume as she pauses to stare directly at the door. You pace through the halls, taking whatever fresh air you can get from within here. You see your door that you pass by, walk to the other side and pace in the other direction. In this time, you even, I suppose, would head up the stairs and then down the stairs. And as you head up the second time and you're pacing, you see a very wealthy-looking figure step outside of one of the doors. His eyes meet yours, and for a moment, he reaches to his hip in concern because you don't quite look the part for all the wealthy people here. Who are you? You're just hanging out? Yes, I am. Who are you? He takes his hand away from his hip, a little bit disarmed. You can just call me Felix. Pleased to meet you, Felix. Oh, excuse me. Sure. He goes to walk by you on his way to the, the uh, galley. And he passes by, you can smell a waft of very expensive cologne. You see, especially as he saw you, he took very careful intent to lock his doors. And he gingerly walks by, locking eyes with yours as he does so. He's a handsome man. She'll give him a bit of a crooked little snicker before she just turns and goes on her way. She doesn't bother to look back at him at all. Sort of the same kind of side eye of looking at him lock the door, being like, yep, I get it. And then moving on her way. You move on your way and walk to the end of this hall where there is a very ornate porthole for this most wealthy section of the ship. Stained glass, but some of it translucent. And you notice something. The fog that 
hung low on the ocean seems to hang even lower now. Um, it gathers thickly. The seas aren't as choppy as they were. They start to become a bit like glass. Even the wind has started to die down a bit. And while you're looking outside, so is someone else. Nihilus, you stand outside on this deck and you begin to see on the mast, at least on your section, a light deposit of white crystal starting to accumulate just lightly. It's as if a mold starting to wrap around the mast, except that it's more crystalline in form. A should be perfectly normal event I require. Um, he has a look around for uh, any of the, the work and deck. Terribly sorry to bother you, but um, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm new to this, but does that, is, is that a normal event? It's not something I've seen before on my shipley travels. That? That? Uh, what are you talking about? That up there, the crystallization, I suppose. On the mast. He looks over at it, and you see for a moment his eyes widen, and then you see him gather a composure to himself. You see this happen right in front of you. You don't need an insight check to notice it. It's so obvious. And he looks back. Sir? Nothing to be alarmed about. However, I do have to go about my duties now. Of course, sir. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, as uh, Nihilus puts his hand on his shoulder and he clasps his own holy cross and he s says a small word of good luck and he casts guidance on him. And with that, the man doesn't go back to tend to the rope. He instead goes right inside and briskly down the halls. Nihilus understands he does try to follow a bit on a slower pace to see if he can overhear any conversation. You head into the halls as well, and please go ahead and roll for me a stealth check. For a total of ten. With a ten, you head down the halls. You see this man is overcome with his brisk walking and urgency. He doesn't pay much attention to what's going on behind him. You head up this set of stairs and you hear the door above you close as somebody has just walked through it. It's a heavy door, definitely one meant for crew. And as you approach it, you put your ear to the door and it is challenging to hear most of what's being said. But there are some words that are said with such vigor, loudness by those saying it, that they ring through enough for you to catch just those words. You hear deposits, saturation, early. It is as he fears. He tries to take his leave before he gets caught into a wrongful situation, and he does try to take his way back to his own quarter uh, with a lot on his mind. Although he does try to keep an insight, uh, I suppose, on the, the rest of the crew workers and see how fast the word spreads and if a, a panic might happen. You don't see anything happening yet. This is all very recent. You know, you're just leaving the conversation with the captain. Yeah. But you are able to make it back to your quarters, and as you enter, you'll find Dr. Glass. Uh, he will knock first, uh, not to intrude. Come in, I suppose. How are you? Are you faring? Uh, you don't have your things yet, do you? Not most of them. Uh, you see, she does have like a small canvas bag that Trevor had left that she's started to pull a few things from just, but she stops now and she says, yes, I'm so sure Trevor will sort it out. He is very resourceful. I am very resourceful as well. Uh, well, that's lovely to hear. <laughs> Sound like a strong duo in that case. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, Mr. Mm. Von Stone, and I'm sure you won't mind uh, just emptying that bag of yours onto the bed so I can make sure you don't have any weapons or anything nefarious. Um, well, I do have uh, very well. And please, call me Nihilus. Nihilus. 
Uh, of course, uh, as I do, um, might I abrupt you with a uh, mere curiosity question? Um, I overheard something particularly interesting. The saturation, are you familiar with it? As he starts to first close his book and clear his things off before he does as instructed, keeping it as a savory last moment. Are you assuming I'll know about it because I'm so very old? Well... Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't mean any rootful Natasha says that. Huh? No, it's all right. You're correct. <laughs> uh, what exactly is your question about the saturation? If you're wondering about the ship, I know it's specifically designed to withstand the saturation, but that's not supposed to be for, for several months. Right. That's what I learned as well, although clear in sightful seeing of the saturation already taken part. Are you quite serious, Mr. Nihilus? I'm afraid I am. Understood. Uh, uh, now, shall we go and figure out this whole saturation business? I would love to. It is prickling on my mind. Yes. God's behest. I wouldn't want it to be a serious cause to delay any travels. And of course, right when we're out of sight of shore, do we find this out? The gods forbid they give us appropriate information. As you head towards the captain's area, you and Nihilus make your way up the stairs and to the door to the captain's chamber where the, the, the rudder is, where all the commands take place. Please roll a perception check. Very well. My, my, what do I see with my eye? A good old dirty 20. Better than my 11, I must be annoyed by having to go up the stairs. Nihilus, you make your way up and you hear inside and you hear, I have to make the announcement. Now, sir, uh, I hope you understand. We are already quite a way into the trip and I think turning back now is simply not an option. There are those on the ship who must make it to Crow Perch. Well, it's for the safety of everybody that we should turn around. Um, sir, a reminder that if you turn around, then payment is no longer afforded for the entire trip, and the bonus that you are offered to continue no longer be on the table. All right, well, at least we're going to keep this one indoors. I have to make an announcement. And he paces across the deck, as you can see through the porthole, to a small device, and he speaks into it. Trevor, Esper, and everybody, you hear... Attention, this is your captain speaking. Captain Ogram Strand of the Meridian Fleet. I regret to inform you that usage of the outdoor spaces will be shut down within the next hour. I repeat, it will be shut down within the next hour. It's important that you wrap up whatever you're doing and make your way inside unless you are crew. Further announcement will come. Thank you very much. And you hear the click off sound. And Trevor, near you, you hear, I've looked everywhere and I can't find any of these bags. I I'm sorry. Uh, well, I mean, I'm still inside, ain't I? I mean, I I can't go back upstairs to her without her stuff, so, you know, why don't you just go do whatever job you need to do? I'll hold the fort down from here. I mean, with the announcement, I don't think it's wise to leave you alone down here. I'm pretty sure it's going to be an all-hands sort of situation. The outdoor area doesn't get shut down for no reason. I must insist that I'd have to escort you out of the cargo hold. I don't know if I have much other option. Well, I mean, really? You got to? Like, you got to, got to? Like, if I don't say nothing, and you don't say nothing, you ain't gonna know, right? You can roll persuasion. Might as well. Give it a shot. Twelve? Twelve? Well, just make sure you're out as soon as you can be, okay? Yeah, 
I mean, of course. Uh, you know, I got one job to do and then I'm out. Thank you. And he'll briskly walk off towards the exit to the cargo hold. Now, you know that you've searched hell, like almost all of the passengers' belongings at this point. Um, what else are you doing down here? Uh, first thing I'm going to do is his mind is still locked on that stowaway. And as he's still continuing to root through boxes looking for the doctor's belongings, he goes, uh, there's like an inner monologue. He's thinking like, well, he's still hanging around here. There's trouble brewing. He might get that pistol again. It might be safer with me. He's going to uh, get up from his place and he is going to walk over uh, to the crate that he saw the disheveled man stow the gun. You go to that crate. You find it. The disheveled man is nowhere to be found. But as you open the crate and you look inside, you see the gun. <sighs> Better safe than sorry. He's gonna take the gun. You do. Please add an ornate golden gun to your inventory. Just like tuck that in. <laughs> He's not a smart man. He's gonna tuck that into his pants, like the back of his pants. Okay. So I'll say it's concealed somewhat. You look around the corner where you originally saw this disheveled man, and you see it's wretched. It's dirty. There's vi empty vials on the ground, and a number of them. You see five or six. You see staining on the floor where sweat or just dirt kind of might have emanated from this person. And you see an outline on the ground where there might have been a cot, but it's been moved. <clears throat> that ain't right. Uh, he's gonna start to slowly shuffle his way uh, towards the outline. Um, someone sleeping here? They... Uh. Hello? Roll investigation. It's at six. I mean, it's clear somebody's been sleeping here, and you can only presume that having found this person there, maybe they just picked up and moved, knowing that somebody knew where they were. The vials, however, these are vials of slow ether. Slow ether is a drug that makes the world more palatable for some. It reduces pain, and it's prone to abuse. <sighs> kind of picking up one of these vials, it just kind of gives a little sniff. All right. He's been here for a bit. Slowly gets up. You still here? There's a scurry down one of the halls, as if startled a bit by her voice or nervous in some way. And one of the small knickknacks on the shelves you hear tumble to the floor, clearly giving a location just 20 feet away. It's in between the rat's nest of shelves and storage. It's going to slowly start to inch his way towards that gap. He's just kind of, as he's doing so, calling out, I know you're still here. It's okay. You just need to come out. All the workers have gone up for a meeting. Okay? 
So just come out slow and calmly. What is your passive perception? Passive perception is a 12. There's a jump from behind you and you feel arms wrap around your shoulders as if trying to pin you down. Immediately, almost as a reflex. Roll an athletics check, by the way. Yeah. All right. Damn. That's just a nine. It catches you by surprise, and its they slam you into one of the shelves. These don't necessarily feel like the arms of a squirrely, strung-out person that you saw earlier, but they hold you and they pin your arms behind your back, and you hear... Now stay real still. I'm holding a gun to your back. If you move, I'm gonna pull the trigger. You hear me? Slow lag. What are you doing, man? I ain't got nothing. All right? As soon as you go out there, I start shouting, you got the whole ship on you. You gotta think this through. I'm thinking, I'm thinking I should leave no evidence behind, but wiser minds will prevail. I want you to give me what you just took. Slow. (sighs) Can't rightly do that while I'm up against this wall. It's down in my pocket. You should be able to see it. I'm gonna go down and reach into your pocket now. You're gonna stay real still, otherwise you're gonna have a hole in the back of your head. Do you understand? (sighs) No, can't rightly say that I do. He begins moving his hand down to reach into your pocket. As soon as I feel the touch leave, he is going to attempt to do a 180 spin back elbow to whoever I'm is standing behind me. Roll a contested athletics check. (sighs) 24. You move briskly. You swing around, and your elbow clocks into the side of this guy's head. You feel it hit, hit real hard. Harder than you might have even expected. A surprise. It slams this man's head to the side into one of the shelves, knocking him unconscious as he falls to the ground. You see... a human man... with... A light five o'clock shadow. In his hand is just a small piece of pipe, and he's now laying unconscious on the ground. Fucking asshole. He's just gonna give one kick to the side of the head. Talk your shit now. And he's just gonna pick up the pipe and just toss it across the room. He's going to try and grab him uh, by the collar of his shirt, and he's going to start trying to drag him up uh, from the storage room. You do so. And as you pull him up the stairs and through the door, you find your way into the halls of the ship. And where are you trying to bring him? Trying to uh, basically take him to the all-hands meeting and give him to them. To the helm? Uh, yeah, wherever they're having that all-hands meeting. Nihilus and Dr. Glass, you hear the door beneath you open to the hall you're snooping in. And as you look over the railing slowly and carefully, you see Trevor carrying a body. Well, perspicacious does get us a funny amount of events on a single day, would it not? So it would seem. What is going on, Trevor? Who is this? Slowly, I 
take uh, the body of the man and I just toss him at the feet. I was looking for your th- stuff. Found some stuff that uh, I didn't reckon I'd find. Claimed to hold a gun to my head. Wanted me to give him this. And I reach into my the back of my pants and I pull out the golden pistol. Ooh, that's quite something to be holding around. I'll say. I don't suppose Dr. Glass recognizes this pistol or notices anything interesting about it. You would know that it is an expensive piece. Guns are expensive to begin with. With such ornamental design with precious metals, this is a very rare find. And I don't recognize him, right? No, you haven't seen this face before. So odd that he would be roughing people up down below. Maybe it's his uh, pistol that you've found. Dear Sir uh, uh, Trevor, now if, if I do understand the situation correctly, you managed to safeguard Dr. Glass's things and, and belongings from this suspected thief in sinning, although this particular item of shiny nature is not under your equipment of inventory, Dr. Glass, so would it not be possible that it is his and this is a clear misunderstanding, or I, I don't want any trouble? It's certainly possible. If it was his gun, he wouldn't be threatening me with a fake gun on my head. Well, he might well be if you took his only gun, Trevor. Uh, Mr. Von Sonnen does have a point. Simple please or thank you could have fucking sufficed. But so's whose is it? I don't know. Maybe whoever took our suite. I think we have enough here to be very confusing to the captain uh, and whoever's with him, though, which is to our advantage. If we just drag this fellow up there and start complaining about things, uh, we can probably find out some information. If need be, I shall be of service and help to however I can, although I prefer not to get into a situation such as this, if that is quite all right with you. And if there are indeed thieves looming about, I prefer to go back to my things in my cabin and uh, put an extra lock in it, if you wouldn't mind. And he goes off. Are we bringing the gun with us? I wouldn't just drop it here, uh, but maybe don't mention it right away. Right. I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do. He kind of tucks the gun uh, in an inside pocket. Remember that a person being able to describe this gun without us having said anything first, that will be useful information. Good thinking. As always, we play our cards close to the chest, as I know you're so good at. Maybe you take the lead on this. I'll, uh, you need any help, I'll back you up. Shall we? After you. And she, the opposite of stealth, clunks her cane up the remaining step and wraps it on the door. Captain? Oh, Captain? You begin to hear an announcement over the intercom system. All right, guests. I regret to inform you the rest of this trip will be handled inside. You'll understand there is the matter of the saturation. Well, it's arrived earlier than expected, which means we must take extra precautions. And as he's speaking, his door opens. And you hear it cut off. And... As the intercom cuts out, Dr. Glass and Trevor, you enter the room. And um, just terrible, terrible, un- unacceptable. I'm sure, Captain, you have to help. I, I, only you can help at this point. I'm really just, I, I, I really am at a loss. It's, it's one thing or it's another. Trevor, bring the, the body in. And that's even honestly, Captain, the least, the least of things. Roll a baseline uh, persuasion check. Only a 19. Oh. Guards? And you see two strong men walk over to the to the door. I... My name is Captain Ogrim. And why, for the life of me, 
that you carry a body onto my... Is this man alive? Uh, yes, of course. I am a doctor. Uh, Wes, is he alive? I don't know. She checked. He's alive, certainly. Is there a medical emergency? The emergency is that this man attacked my man Trevor here while he was trying to find the luggage that you have lost because you've separated me from my security and housed me with a complete stranger, a young man, no less. And now you are telling me that I'm to be trapped in my room this entire journey with a strange man and no access to my trusty bodyguard here. What is the meaning of any of this? Someone's taken my suite that I paid for well in advance and I still don't even know who. And then again, ruffians in storage attacking my man Trevor. Tell me you can do something, Captain. You see a, a processing happening on his face. This is a man who doesn't deal with customer service, at least not anymore, if he ever has. And he takes a moment to gather. All right, all right. Um, why were you in the storage hold? That's off limits to any traveler who's on the ship. Uh, well, unfortunately, as the doctor had instructed me, I was to gather her belongings. And so I went down there and lo and behold, this guy comes and tries to sneak attack me. Uh, let me see. And the captain moves forward to this man. Um, all right. Let's see here. He goes through pockets. You know, he sees the napkin, the toothpicks, and he goes into the shirt and turns the collar inside out. And he goes to different parts, and finally he finds an embroidery on it that says... Gray. Um, can you look up the name Gray, please, in the directory? Yes, sir, of course. And, uh, a moment goes by. Todd Gray. Ooh, one of our most elite travelers, I see. All right. You say this wealthy man uh, attacked you in the storage hold. I don't doubt your words. Good. But I'm trying to ascertain as to why that might be. You wouldn't happen to have instigated something, would you? Oh yes, doubt Trevor when the only one who has not kept their word is the staff of your ship. And she shoots Trevor a look. Are you okay in this conversation, or should I steamroll? First of all, if you're going to yell at me, you can yell at him too. He was down there with me. And second, uh, it was kind of hard to start a fight when he was, well, what I thought was a gun at the time holding it to my back, pushing me up against a wall, telling me to empty my pockets. Roll deception. He was asking for something specific. All right. <laughs> uh, deception. 16? All right. I'll take the assumption that this clearly very wealthy man was trying to rob you of your belongings. <sighs> Look. I don't have time for this right now. There's more pressing matters at hand. Please leave him here. We'll take him to the infirmary and get to the bottom of this later. I want to thank you for bringing this to my attention and would like to advise you find your way to your rooms and you don't cause any more trouble. And while he was going over the body, can Dr. Glass have just taken in the room to see if there's any anything unusual or hints about this saturation business? You can do so. And as you look around, you see that the little uh, kind of captain's board of announcements uh, has a little flashing light on it. One that looks concerning. Outside of the window, though, is what you find more interesting. The air is thickly white, and these wisps of, like, texture to the air seem to whip around and you see as it almost looks like it's encircling the mast and you see the white deposits now thick uh, around it even seems to feel heavier and the ship seems to feel lower in the water the captain has a table with all sorts of papers sprawled out a map of course to his destination and his crew seems to be working overtime as they handle all of the little 
devices, knickknacks, and buttons that are around this deck. Dr. Glass straightens up a bit, her shoulders drop, and she looks at the captain and she says, Well, Captain, we seem to have fucked up, haven't we? 